Well, it's really a pleasure to be here. I appreciate the opportunity. And um, I've been really impressed by the conversation this morning and by the models that we've already heard from. They're terrific. And I'm excited to share a little bit about what we have done at Intermountain Healthcare. And we really launched in, uh, uh, we, we implemented um, genomics in cancer initially and then sort of blossomed from there. And honestly, uh, five years ago, when we started our uh, cancer genomics program, I didn't necessarily anticipate that it would um, spread and grow the way that it has, but uh, we kind of caught the front of a wave and it's been uh, a lot of fun. And we have a long ways to go and a lot to learn. So uh, I just thought I would share a little bit about uh, how we have gone about implementing um, genomic medicine and precision oncology and then uh, share some of the outcomes that we have measured. And I'll conclude by talking about how we have begun to spread outside of oncology into other medical verticals and disciplines. For those who may not be aware, Intermountain Healthcare is an integrated uh, health delivery network uh, headquartered in Salt Lake City, Utah. It consists of 22 hospitals, about 180 um, physician clinics. Uh, you can see the license beds there, and it has a health plan uh, much like you have heard uh, from other health systems, that it covers almost a million lives now, uh, which is powerful. And uh, uh, the other metric that I don't have up here is that uh, we physically see in one of our hospitals or clinics 50% of the population every year. So we are touching uh, people within the state of Utah on a regular basis, um, which uh, is nice and gives us access. When we initially launched the Precision Oncology Program, this is the workflow that we built and uh, I think a lot of people in this room could uh, have a slide that shows a similar workflow. Uh, specifically on oncology, um, patients are seen initially in the first day, and over the course of the next several days, um, we obtain their specimen and do this molecular analysis. And what we are running is a tumor-only panel in oncology uh, of about 170 genes. So it's targeted sequencing. It sees all of the relevant mutation types. Um, and we're not doing accompanying germline in oncology right now, although we are doing that in other settings. And then ultimately, um, we do a bioinformatics review, and we implemented this step right here called the Molecular Tumor Board uh, only after we had not launched our initial test offering. And the reason that we did that is we found that frontline uh, community oncologists were not familiar with interpreting uh, basic genomic test results. They would receive a test result and outside of KRAS or BRAF, uh, the rest of it would read like Greek. And uh, we found that therefore they wouldn't utilize the information at all and would just uh, turn the report upside down, set it aside and say, that made me feel dumb and I'm not gonna do that again. <laughs> and, and so we implemented this molecular tumor board as a way to distill down the Greek, and what the Molecular Tumor Board does is review every single case that comes through our system. And we are now, as a system, uh, we have a goal to test all advanced cancer patients, uh, meaning perform a genomic profile on the tumors of all advanced cancer patients, which ends up being about 1,500 to 2,000 um, tests per year. And the Molecular Tumor Board reviews each one and provides an interpretation that simplifies things and simply states, uh, Tar you know, consider targeting this gene with this drug, and we'll offer one or two um, options for that uh, frontline provider to consider. And doesn't include all of the, um, you know, amino acid substitution and precise location of the mutation and all of those things that confuse uh, frontline providers. That's included on the report, but it's down lower so that those who want to read it can, but you have to look for it. So this overall process now takes us about 10 days. When we first started, uh, to Mark's excellent point, we knew that we had done it wrong and we guaranteed it or your money back. Um, and it took us 25 days when we first started and now we have whittled it down to about 10 days, uh, business days, uh, which is meaningful clinically for oncology patients. This is uh, an example of what the report looks like and I mentioned this molecular tumor board interpretation. Um, and so we, we really distill it down by saying, look, here is a gene, here are some drugs that you can use. If we were generating this report today, you might see osimertinib and some other options as well. Uh, and so it's regularly updated. Uh, I, I don't usually spend a lot of time talking about this, but we even have an order button so that if a provider um, sees a, a gene drug match that they like, that they want to engage for their patient, they can simply, simply click on that button and we actually have um, a drug procurement team 
I like to call them the drug dealers, and they love it. They totally love that name. And they engage and go about working with the uh, payer to get a drug approved uh, uh, or to find a clinical trial or whatever mechanism we can to get a drug for a patient. And that's actually a dedicated couple of FTEs that do that full time. And it's really those two steps, the molecular tumor board and the drug procurement team that has overcome what we think are the two major hurdles to implementing uh, genomic medicine into cancer care. Uh, without those two pieces, we found that um, tests were ordered and the information was never acted upon or utilized. So just to uh, you know, highlight what everyone already knows is that we were able to find in uh, lots of these advanced cancer patients variants that we know are actionable from other disease types. So here's an example of a colon cancer patient who had a HER2 amplification and we confirmed, um, more for academic purposes than anything, the high level amplification of HER2 and found that uh, this patient's tumor har harbored approximately 30 copies of HER2, so it was a very high level amplification. And when we provided targeted anti-HER2 therapy um, uh, in this patient who was refractory to chemotherapy, um, you can see that there was this robust response. So, so while on chemo, these two hypodense lesions in the liver, of course, grew. And then when providing an anti-HER2 therapy, these lesions shrunk and this patient did well for a very long time, had a dramatic response, and we have come across anecdotes like this over and over again. And of course, the problem with anecdotes is that they are anecdotes. Uh, and so we have to really generate more robust um, population level data. And so we have tried to do that. And one of the studies that we published a couple of years ago uh, was this retrospective uh, matched cohort study where we took patients who had had genomic testing and received targeted therapy and we matched them to other patients in our system who had not received genomic therapy or tar uh, genomic testing or targeted therapy. Uh, and these were patients that we pulled from our initial pilot study. Uh, I, I failed to mention initially that we launched this as a pilot study across three hospitals. And on the strength of the data that I'm going to show you, we then uh, expanded from there to cover all 22 hospitals. So these patients were matched according to age, gender, diagnosis, and number of previous lines of treatment. So to be a case in control, you had to, be, you had to have two 62-year-old men with a metastatic pancreatic cancer who had both failed two previous lines of therapy as a way to control for where they were at in their stage of disease. And then we assessed for progression-free survival and also overall survival. And then we did something that uh, Intermountain Healthcare and I think a lot of integrated systems love to do, which is look at the cost of care, which we can do because we also have a health plan. So we know what the charges are associated with uh, these patients' care. And what we found is that uh, there was a really dramatic improvement in overall survival in these patients. And this was a small retrospective study. So I think, um, you know, take, take these results accordingly. Uh, but we did find that there was this not only progression-free survival advantage, but also this overall survival advantage. And uh, I know that this is a little bit of an atypical way to demonstrate survival data. You usually see a Kaplan-Meier curve, and we have those. I'll, sh I'll show you this uh, one in just a minute. But the reason I love this particular figure is because uh, you have the charge data accompanying it. So these bars right here represent charge events during the course of a patient's care. And a little red box uh, would indicate that there was a very uh, expensive uh, charge event. So the patient went to the emergency room for some reason, for example. And then, um, you know, gray areas mean time has passed when no charge event occurred. And a green box would mean that um, some low level charge event occurred. And the overall picture, kind of like a heat map that I hope is coming out here is that there are more intense um, charge events happening here in patients uh, who are receiving the next line of standard therapy compared to those who are receiving this uh, genomically informed uh, medicine. When you look at that uh, more granularly, um, we find that, uh, in fact, the overall cost of care in patients who received standard therapy was a little bit higher than when we used this um, uh, genomic medicine approach. In fact, we ended up saving about $730 per patient per week. And I always have to emphasize that it's per patient per week because, of course, they live longer. And, and in, I was in a meeting, and, and one of our executive leaders said, well, uh, do we really want to be doing this if they're all going to live twice as long and we have to? <laughs> and I said, stop. Just don't, I don't think you're going to want to say what you're about to say. <laughs> and, 
<laughs> we should be so lucky that we have that problem to worry about. Um, and so uh, it's, it was very exciting. And on the strength of this data where we saw improved survival and a cost savings, we approached our health plan. Oh, before we approach our health plan, I'll just give you a little more breakdown on where we saved this money. Uh, so we, uh, it, that survival data came from a small cohort, but then we looked at a much larger cohort of patients from our health plan. We took 2,000 patients, those who uh, had received a targeted therapy that were not necessarily um, in our study, and there ended up being about 100 of those who had had genomic testing and received targeted therapy, uh, and approximately uh, 1,700 patients um, who had not received a targeted therapy. And when we looked at the costs of care in those cohorts, we found that um, we actually were saving money uh, in the inpatient setting for patients who received uh, genomically informed medicine. And we believe that's because they were having um, fewer severe adverse events, uh, neutropenic events, and other things requiring hospitalization. On the other hand, uh, we spent more money in the outpatient setting and that's largely because of the expense of the therapies themselves. So a lot of these patients were receiving oral targeted therapies and those just um, cost more, which is no secret. So on the strength of that data with the cost savings across the, uh, a little bit larger population of our insurance plan covered um, group, we met with our insurance plan, the, the team from Select Health is the name of our insurance plan, and ultimately, they uh, came up with this policy where they are now covering um, testing in all advanced cancer patients as long as they meet these criteria that include having stage 4 disease and having failed at least one line of standard therapy. And so that, that was really nice to see that our payers uh, are interested in uh, analyzing data that we generated in our own health system and that they have been responsive in developing a policy that uh, benefits their members. And I have found this to be the case over and over again, generally, that payers want to be at the table, they want to have the conversation, they want to do things that they think will benefit their members, and I think uh, whenever there's a breakdown in communications with payers, it's because there hasn't been communication. And, and I think that we, as providers and scientists, can be more proactive in engaging our colleagues on the payer side. Uh, so we have now expanded beyond cancer and are moving into other places. To do this, you know, there, there's this question of uh, aligning the economics and the financial incentives to make it happen. And we're starting to view these as products. And so we now offer this uh, cancer panel test that I talked about. And we have gone on to now start offering pharmacogenomic testing, which we're using in all of the mental health clinics across Intermountain Healthcare, which has been really exciting. And, and I'll talk about how those patients are being selected for testing. And then we've also recently launched um, a hereditary um, cancer uh, testing panel uh, that just includes the standard um, breast, breast and ovarian cancer genes uh, and, a, and a few others. All of these are orderable within our EMR, which is a Cerner system, and they're all reportable that same way, uh, which is making the, the research associated with that um, much more relevant, which has been uh, exciting. So as we launch each of these new products in these different verticals, we've tried to have the discipline of saying, okay, here is a product that we are now offering and let's measure the impact. And we can never launch something, in my opinion, unless we're also uh, unless we also have a really uh, clearly defined mechanism for measuring impact or clinical outcomes. And that's, that's one of the um, promises that we've made to our payer and that we think is important uh, for our patients as well. And so I already, I already uh, showed this data, but in our uh, cancer testing panel, for example, we saw this improvement in survival and we saw this um, cost savings. And so we uh, have published that and returned that to the payer uh, and that has uh, given us additional credibility, and we anticipate doing the same thing in mental health. So we are now um, offering this uh, called RX Match, which is a pharmacogenomic test for all patients, uh, not only in the mental health clinics, but also in the primary care setting. Um, and we worked with our colleagues in the uh, mental, in the behavioral health a clinical program to define which patients exactly should be offered this testing and where should it be conducted. And ultimately, we came up with just these two criteria. And we actually found that the primary care providers really wanted very specific criteria on how to implement this. What they don't want 
at least in, in our system, was for someone to show up and say, you could consider ordering this test that's now available. Um, that, that throws them off. They don't know what to do with that. Uh, they want really specific criteria. So uh, working with our mental health experts, we ultimately determined that all patients who have a new diagnosis of depression or anxiety and are going to be treated with an antidepressant should have this pharmacogenomic testing. Uh, in addition, any patient uh, that has an existing diagnosis of depression or anxiety and is not responding should have this testing. And so those clear criteria have really helped the primary care providers in knowing how to implement it and, and the ordering rate is very high. There is a third criterion that I didn't list here, which is if a primary care provider or any doctor just wants to order it, they can. So we don't, we don't preclude you from ordering, but there is some specific guidance on which um, populations to target. This uh, additional um, product I'm calling it is the hereditary cancer um, panel product. And so uh, some of these slides, if they, if they look uh, kind of like marketing, it's because our marketing team has gotten a hold of them uh, and are sharing some of these with patients. Um, but the basic idea here that everyone in this room knows is that there is a percentage of the population out there of patients who get cancer where that was an inherited um, there, they had an inherited risk and we could have known that up front. Uh, and so we're trying to uh, do better at finding uh, who those patients are and we'll be measuring the impact of that, we hope. Um, and then we have built a robust uh, system-wide genetic counseling program. Uh, I don't think we're as far along as Geising or not many are, uh, but we know that we have to have a more robust program. And so we've been really working on decreasing uh, the, the time to obtaining a genetic counseling appointment in anticipation of launching a more broad population level genomics effort in the near future. All of what I have talked about has uh, resulted in us making decisions about whether we should be doing this testing in-house versus sending it out of house, and we do both. Uh, we have some tests that we send out. A lot of our germline testing goes out of house uh, to other labs, including to, to Bob's <laughs> and other places. And then we do a fair amount of testing ourselves in-house, and we have ended up building a large um, uh, whole genome high throughput sequencing center that allows us to do whole genome whole exome, whole transcriptome sequencing, uh, and we also have proteomic capabilities there. Um, and this has really enabled a lot of what we want to do in the future, and that includes things like uh, not only whole genome and whole exome sequencing um, and, and partnering with external collaborators, uh, but specifically uh, clinically, we anticipate launching um, whole genome sequencing in the NICU uh, later this year. We also are developing a precision nephrology panel with our nephrology team, um, and we're embarking on an analysis of the four and a half million samples that are in our biorepository for which there is accompanying clinical data, and that will primarily be a research effort. So the overall strategy or model that has really started with an effort in uh, genomic or, or uh, cancer genomics is to now broaden outside of cancer and take advantage of the uh, structure that already exists in our health system where clinical programs are organized um, already and it includes you know women and newborns behavioral health cardiovascular medicine neurosciences pediatric oncology and all of these different uh, vertical uh, medical disciplines, as well as services such as um, pain management, uh, respiratory and sleep services, nutrition services, laboratory services. And we are engaging with um, the leadership in each one of these clinical programs and services to identify where the key genomic medicine opportunities exist and how we can develop the uh, capabilities to implement uh, genomic medicine in each of those disciplines. And that's really the model that we're now working along. Um, and I hope to have even more results to share in the future uh, with our success, hoped to be successes in these other uh, disciplines. So with that, uh, I'll just say thank you and acknowledge all of these people who have been uh, doing all of the work, and I'd be happy to take any clarifying questions. Thanks, Lincoln. Any, um, so Terry and yeah. then Jeff. Jeff. I just Jeff. To my car. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have a question about um, molecular tumor boards. Uh, in general, are there standards across the, the tumor boards and how they operate? And, and have you or any of them ever done an, uh, an experiment to swap cases and see if you come up with the same recommendation? 
Yeah, great question. I would love to answer that as a yes, but uh, you know, um, Howard and I were just talking about this the other day. There really are not standards across, there are molecular tumor boards all over the country, right? Every institution loves to brag about theirs. Uh, there's one sponsored by ASCO that, uh, for their TAPER trial. Uh, there are other um, molecular tumor boards. Um, I will say that uh, there are not standards. I think we're coalescing around uh, general agreements. Uh, the biggest challenge, I believe, where most discrepancies lie is on these, in these um, biomarkers where they're, they're kind of soft. You know, the, the gene drug correlation is not real tight. Uh, there may be some preclinical or early clinical evidence, but there, beyond that, it's, it's not as strong. So it's, you know, things like AKT alterations, you know, do you use ever an mTOR inhibitor, for example? Um, and, and these kind of soft targets. We have not done the experiment of swapping with another institution, uh, although I, I can tell you that I'm on multiple uh, molecular tumor boards. I'm on ours, of course, and then I'm on uh, one for TAPER and another institution's molecular tumor board. And while there generally is consensus around major driver uh, oncogenes and, and tumor suppressor uh, mutations, it's these, these uh, less well-known uh, variants that where, where it breaks down, and there's frankly not consensus. Uh, yeah, I was curious about your cost data, and I don't know if we could bring your slides back up, but you may, you may remember them. So, so you had one slide that had a table of cost per week, and yep. there there was really substantial savings in the outpatient realm. And then in the next slide, you had this histogram um, that was just cost in the last three months of lives where there of life where there was increased cost in the outpatient setting. So, so my question had, had been, until I saw the second slide, w why is there so much savings in the outpatient realm um, on the per week basis, do you know? Yeah, I think uh, in that initial slide, the, it appeared to be, there appeared to be a cost savings in the outpatient setting because those patients weren't coming in as often. They were on oral therapy, so they would come in once a month, and they weren't coming in for um, uh, IV hydration or infusions of chemotherapies. A lot of our patients getting chemotherapies will come in every week or every two weeks, not only for the chemo itself, but then subsequently for hydrations and, and other supportive care. Yeah, so that, that last three months of life data, obviously, it's a very different period, and, and yet the outpatient savings, I think, are something to, to emphasize. Yeah, so that's a great point. I totally agree. And part of the reason we came up with that last three months of life metric is because that's what our payers were, our payer was really interested in, right? They wanted to know, like, they're constantly worried that they're dumping all their resources into the last three months of life for these patients. And so they were actually quite pleased to see that, um, see those metrics. Yeah. Okay, Good thank point. you.